All right, this is a webcast for Modern European History, French Revolution Unit, SI number 11. In SI 12, we deal with uh, the Napoleonic Empire. And Napoleon's reign comes to an end when he's exiled for the second time at this tiny little island here at the tip of the, the arrow in this image. Uh, this island's in the Atlantic, as you can see, between South America and Af Africa. And this is where Napoleon will be for the rest of his life and die. As you can see in this image, kind of shows that uh, Napoleon is a fallen and broken man. So once Napoleon is gone, of course, we have another shift of power in this French Revolution story. Something in the form of government and governmental leadership will need to take form to uh, govern France as well as Europe. As you can look at this map. This map shows kind of the uh, expansion of the French Empire. If you use the dark blue and the and the light blue, shows the French Empire and those countries that were controlled by Napoleon. Remember, Spain had. Napoleon's brother put on the throne. So this light blue shows not France, but an extension of France. And then, of course, the pink French allies. So the French Revolution, and particularly the Napoleon, Napoleonic Empire, extends French boundaries as well as French influence widely throughout the continent. Therefore, when Napoleon is removed, not only France, but these other nation states in Europe are going to go through some type of transformation politically. This map is, is a nice map. It, it kind of shows you what the boundaries after the Napoleonic Empire will look like in Europe starting in 1815. And I want to point out this bold magenta color here. That is the boundary of the German Confederation. So all along, we've seen in Europe the Holy Roman Empire made up of various Germanic kingdoms, princes, kind of cobbled together. And now we're starting to see a, a step forward towards the making of the nation of Germany. But before we do that, we're going to see a confederation of German states being formed together. That's, that's an important move in European history and certainly relates to uh, this SI number 11, as you will see. So here's your title slide. Uh, these are the subjects that we want to kind of work through and understand. Um, the subject of SI 11 is the Congress of Vienna and the restoration of, uh, of Europe following the Napoleonic Empire years. This is a sketch of the Congress of Vienna. You can see there's quite a few people there. Uh, these are all diplomats and heads of states from the European nations that are coming together to meet and uh, conduct diplomacy to figure out what is Europe going to look like now that Napoleon has been uh, exiled. Another sketch kind of shows you the same thing. You can see there's a lot of people involved um, pointing to maps. So one of the things that they're really trying to reconfigure here is borderlines, national borders. Uh, one of the other things that this sketch kind of gets us involved with also is that uh, besides the political, there's also a gathering of uh, these national leaders, along with their families, their wives, their kids, uh, all of the, their advisors that help them to conduct national business, uh, descended upon Vienna. Let me go back and show you Vienna. Vienna here, in the Austrian Empire. And really, it was a party. It was a, certainly a political event, political diplomacy, but it was also a party to celebrate uh, the defeat of Napoleon and the demise of Napoleon. So some important concepts with this 
Congress of Vienna story is legitimacy and restoration. So I've defined them here, and you kind of want to look to see how these get plugged into some of these other topics that we're going to cover. Uh, legitimacy or legitimate. One of the concepts of the Congress of Vienna is to restore the former ruling families that were deposed or kicked out of power because of the French Revolution and how, and also how the French Revolution kind of extended into other other nations. So the restoring of legitimate ruler families. That's we're talking about monarchies, the former monarchies that had been removed from power. There's a video clip. Uh, I suggest that you watch this. You can start at 11 minutes, 32 seconds. It will it will pick up with the Congress of Vienna story. Guy tells the story much like I'm trying to do now, but in a different way and, and uh, maybe with some other insight, it might be a helpful tool for you. So to work through the SI topics, uh, we have the statesman part A, and you can see the nations represented. Uh, these are the most important nations represented in their leadership. The guy pictured here on this slide is Clemens von Metternich. So he is the uh, diplomat for Austria, and of course Austria is where Vienna is located, so they're the hosting the Congress. Um, and he's really a driving force with much of the political ideas also. So he's an important player. Some of the goals of the Congress. We've already talked about restoration. So number one goal is to restore the legitimate ruling families who had been uprooted by revolution. Uh, you could get a couple of examples here. So particularly in France, we know that Louis the 16th was executed by the revolutionaries, ending the monarchy in France. But uh, his brother is going to be put on the the throne uh, and become the next uh, monarch uh, ruling France during this Congress of Vienna and 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 following in the following years. Another major uh, goal and idea of the Congress of Vienna when these diplomats were meeting was to contain France. So in order to contain France so that it won't be a future threat to them or the continent, uh, you want to make sure that you bolster up power that uh, kind of geographically surrounds France. So we know that Great Britain is across the channel to the north and it's already a strong power, but we needed to strengthen up Spain and you can see here the Congress of Vienna borderline in this map once again. And so one of the reasons why the German states were kind of loosely binded together in this confederation style government is to make it a stronger whole to pro provide an eastern balance and containment of power uh, for France. So we kind of have a north, an east, similar things are happening down here in unifying the, the papal states, what becomes Italy, in the south, as well as to the west, Spain. So therefore, it can kind of contain France so that it doesn't have any uh, expansive tendencies like we saw with the Napoleonic Empire years. And that's uh, part B, the balance of power, uh, is, is what I've just described. The theory of this is that if we have a balance of power, meaning all of the European nations have a similar power base politically and, and economically and militarily, then uh, nobody would have a true advantage. And without a true advantage, you might not have the self-interest to attack and uh, try to extend your boundaries versus some other European state. So a balance of power would be the mechanism to provide continental peace and stability. One of the main debates in the Congress of Vienna was regarding Poland right here. You see the Kingdom of Poland pops up on the map. In the previous map that I showed you, we'll go backwards. You don't you don't see Poland here. It's kind of gotten wiped off the map and um, of course, in the Congress of Vienna, its diplomats wanted to make sure that 
Poland uh, had some national sovereignty, but there was some conflicts of interest between Prussia and Russia because both desired this territory. But after a lot of debate, it was agreed that uh, the Kingdom of Poland would be established there with some territorial boundaries, but it would be uh, included within the Russian Empire and the Tsar of Russia would be kind of a, an over uh, arching political figure. So it has some sovereignty, some national identity, but not complete sovereignty or complete national identity. There's a phrase that gets thrown into the mix here with the Congress of Vienna, and that's the concert of Europe. So much like this symphonic concert is made up of different um, players with different instruments, when they're all played together, it creates this enormous and pleasing sound that we call symphonic music. And really that's what they were aiming to do here is that they have all these diplomats and all these nation states work together in unison to play a pleasing sound. If you had one of these instruments that just started playing on its own, uh, not following the sheet music, uh, something would uh, definitely just that that would destroy um, the purpose of this performance. So they really took this idea of a concert, a symphonic Europe, um, to really be interested in uh, mediating disputes and uh, having a, a sense of working together in order to produce uh, a stable Europe and, and try to help prevent future conflicts. And all that is kind of wrapped up in this idea of a Congress system. So what these nations uh, uh, agreed to do is to work together as if in a symphony, but with a particular ideology in mind. Um, they definitely did not like the revolution in France, and they felt that it uh, you know, created disorder. It also uh, weakened or ruined some old standing traditions um, that the, these conservative diplomats really um, believed in and trusted in. So um, one of the ways in which they work together in this Congress system is to use their force and their power collectively together to try to put down future revolutions. So in that, we can identify them as conservatives. I'm going to remind you about the political spectrum. So the conservatives would be over kind of here. Now, they're not necessarily replicating the, the old conservative order of the uh, absolutism and the estate system exactly like it was before it was dismantled in France and other places. But, but they're sympathetic to the traditions of monarchy. They're sympathetic to people of the uh, privileged and wealthy class having an, a place in power. They really don't want to see people power because they trust um, democracy as being more like mob rule and uh, producing things like the reign of terror. So you're going to see a, a tension here. The, obviously, the liberals that want change and even radical change are not going to like the policies and, and uh, the political nature of the Congress of Vienna. And that's why there's going to be future tension down the road uh, because these political uh, ideologies of the right and the left are going to continue to clash, and it will um, produce some other momentous events, such as in, in, in France, we have some other French Revolution stories coming down the road because of the differences between the conservative and liberal ideologies. Uh, the Holy Alliance is the last term here. You can kind of see some of these Congress of Vienna diplomats uh, sketched here, standing together, holding hands. Um, the guy in the middle is Tsar Alexander I. He is the uh, monarch of Russia. And what he's proposing, really, as an idea for the this Congress system is that they use their, uh, their Christian morality and Christian principles to help guide them in terms of their policies. Um, 
most of the other leaders, diplomats, thought this was a crazy idea. And even though they, they listened and, and respected the proposal of a holy alliance by Tsar Alexander I, and they didn't dispute it, at least publicly, uh, personally and behind closed doors, they really rejected the idea of having Christian principles and morality guide their foreign policies. And at this point, we really start to see a major major turning point in Europe and I think has a, an impact on the world still today. And that is when coming to international relations and international policies, um, no longer is it going to be guided by church figures uh, or uh, a, a Christian ideology. Now national self-interest is really going to be the prevailing attitude and idea that's going to craft these policies and uh, and so you have really a separation of Christianity it's it's really no longer in the the realm and sphere of of politics separated from politics um, and this is where it really kind of cements the idea of separation of church and state we see we see a major turning point here where the church particularly the Catholic Church is not um, part of the political process. They're a separate entity. Um, and we'll have to see as history unfolds whether or not uh, this turning point of separating Christian morality and uh, national policy and national relations uh, was going to produce positive results or uh, negative results.